Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Deconstructed. We have a wonderful guest again today with us, uh, a very unique guest, as, a, as I want to really set the, the stage a little bit. But before I say a little bit more about uh, Alex, if you will, let me introduce myself. I'm Sai, if you will, and uh, I'm a business coach and consultant. I focus on transformation and change. I love partnering with organizations and really helping those organizations calibrate, if you will, their business models and operating models to achieve the maximum impact. This touches everything from dual strategy and business and leadership and culture and execution and technology to everything under the sun uh, all around. So always interesting and, and learning opportunities. If, uh, Modisir actually is not gonna be able to join me today. So it'll be myself and, and Alex. But before I, I welcome the gentleman in, let me mention a few things about Alex and in particular why it's such a treat to, to have him with us today. So. Alex is an internet uh, talk radio show uh, that is also on Voice of America and the business channel has been around since 2017 and it's preparing for the unexpected. Uh, I highly recommend the show. I, I always point clients to the show very, very openly. And I've mentioned that to Alex. I think there's great value in both the guests that he has, as well as the perspective that he provides in his professional experience as well as being really at the intersection of a lot of conversations, very much in the same vein that Mudasir and I really take. So a little bit more about Alex again before I welcome him. He's been at this since uh, 1996. So definitively a, a, a tremendous track record with business continuity, disaster recovery, emergency management, operational resilience, crisis management, pandemic planning, a whole list of, of things that we can, we can really talk about in our conversation today. That provides a tremendously rich lens for him to engage his guests. And then as he's engaged his guests, and again, this intrigues me very, very critically about hosts, they become the intersection of all their guests and their own experience and can offer a very, very refreshing point of view. With all of that being said, we have the great pleasure of having Alex with us today. Welcome, Alex. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sai. I really appreciate that. and. Uh... Uh, I like the, what you mentioned there, becoming a uh, a point for all the guests and to spread help uh, spread their knowledge. Um, and you're one of them, by the I way. I appreciate it. It hasn't aired yet, but uh, you are one of them. I appreciate well, it, my friend. It is truly, truly a tremendous honor to have you. I mean, all around. And, I, and I, I love the description that you provide for your show, as well as your background and experience. But before we dive into that detail, you know, help our audience understand, who is Alex? Uh, well, I guess there's the personal side and the professional side, right? So let's start with the uh, personal side. Um, believe it or not, I am a quiet introvert. I'm the person who sits in the back corner or they're off to the sides. Um, I'm not right in there in your face, um, which is kind of opposite of doing a podcast and talking to so many people. Um, but I'm, I'm quiet. Um, I do puzzles. I am a practicing Buddhist. Uh, I like to hike, curl have a dog um, who thankfully is sleeping right now and hopefully he stays asleep at least for the next hour <laughs> and um, you know I, I'm originally from England um, I you know I taught myself how to play uh, keyboards over the pandemic because I needed Goodness. something to do so uh, I taught myself how to do that um, not the greatest but you know I can get by on a couple of things now so and professionally, well, you kind of said a lot of it. I've been around since uh, 96, got all the certifications, went through Y2K and 9-11 and pandemics, SARS, um, H1N1, all kinds of different things that have gone on, uh, been around for ages, written books on uh, topics related to the industry, uh, got uh, had the pleasure of interviewing, getting to know so many fantastic people um, yourself included, you're, you're on that list as well. Mm -hmm. And learning, I found even after I started this uh, six and a half years ago, the first one to start this, by the way, in this industry. And I found that, you know, hey, I know a lot. You know, I could probably get some really good guests. And then after a few shows, I realized, wow, there's so much more to learn. I'm only looking at things from my experience only. And there's, even from my experiences, there are different ways to look at it and learn. Uh, and I just went, wow, this is incredible. I'm learning so much more than I could ever learn by not doing this. 
Uh, and I think that's the big perspective that I come from is you know, educating myself and educating everybody out there that you know, what we do, it's not just a BIA or creating a plan. It's, there's so much more to it. So um, that's me in a nutshell. Well, I guess mm -hmm. that's kind of a big nutshell, but uh, that's me. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. And you, and you really touched upon something, you know, that, that I think resonated with me when I, you know, first encountered your show and what have you is that there's some people that host and respectfully their ego gets inflated and that's not you. And what really attracted to me is you retain the humanity throughout all the conversations, exactly like you said, I know a lot, but there's a lot to learn. So I, I love the humanity that you bring forward. Yeah. That, I, I've, mentioned it to a lot of guests, you know, I, I want you to be comfortable. I want you to say what you want to say. You are the star here, not me. You know, I, I'm just providing a platform for you and I'll ask some questions and I have no issues with playing the dummy. Sometimes I may know the answer, but a lot of times I don't. I may know it from my perspective, but I may not know it from theirs and from their history. And it's like, what a, an amazing chance to learn. And I, I think if you know, some people want to brag, you know, I have this, I have that. Well, you're going about it the wrong way. You know, you, you make that other person the star. When you meet someone in a bar, in a restaurant, on the street, in the dog park, you know, get to know them. You know, it's not all about you. And you'll, you'll grow so much faster and better if you make it about somebody else, which I know seems kind of opposite with the way you think it would work. But um, that's the way I feel. I, I, I enjoy talking with all these people because I'm learning from them, constantly learning from them. Yeah. Yeah. Very much, and very much consistent in the philosophy that we've embraced. I mean, that lot of resonance exactly. And that's again, why I'm so attracted to, to, to you and, and the work that you're doing in the show and everything. So, so my good friend, I want to, I want to walk through some of the verbiages in the description and I, I'd love for you to elaborate, guide, refine, whatever you like, but, but sure. the things that grab us, I mean, truly grab us, um, you know, you, as you describe preparing for the unexpected, you talk about how people, organizations, and communities plan and respond to sudden unplanned events, natural and man-made disasters and crises. It, it, the word communities grabbed me first, to be honest with you. But any thoughts on, on that, that bit of, of the description? Uh, well, first, I want to say the title, Preparing for the Unexpected, came about literally at the last minute. Well, I could not think of a title. And just in a conversation, I said, all I want to do is make sure people are prepared for the unexpected. <laughs> and someone just looked at me and they tilted their head. And I went, that's the title, isn't it? <laughs> and they went, yep. Nice. <laughs> and so it came about uh, that way. Um, but people, organizations, and communities... A lot of times when we're thinking of resilience or business continuity, we are just thinking of organizations, you know, an insurance company, a financial institution, or what have you. And I always thought, no, it's bigger than that, because I use business continuity on a daily basis. I could be driving to the office, the mall, going grocery shopping, whatever the case may be, and the road is blocked because of an accident or construction or whatever. I have to think right off the bat, okay, how do I get around this? What do I do to keep going? Hmm, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that what our business continuity and resilience plans do? Yeah, they do. So it's using it every day and then just using it in different ways in different situations. And I thought, well, this is much bigger than just you know what uh, someone sitting in an office may think you know uh, what business continuity is. We have to have this and this and this and this. But we're actually doing it in so many other different areas of our lives. And communities are doing it too. When they are having construction, hopefully they do. I know the city I do live, they do. If they're blocking off a street, they're having construction, they'll tell you different ways to get around it. You know, they're they're creating plans, putting things in place, they're communicating, uh, you know, and, and, and putting in all the follow-ups, you know, hey, now you can go back on that road, you know, when they take their temporary signs down, you know, all the the stuff that happens pre, during, and after, whatever it is they're trying to convey. And I thought, well, yeah, so it's not just organizations. It's my community. It's my uh, personal side as well and my employer, but also the other uh, businesses that my employer is working with as well. So it gets even bigger. 
And then when we're talking communities, I know you've had Dr. David Lindstedt on the show before, mm -hmm. and he wrote about this. And I actually said uh, had a conversation about this a long time ago, but he, he said it in his book as well, that within your organization, there are different communities. You know, there could be four people from four different areas, but they're all in the same curling league. So they all play together. So they talk. Um, there could be people who are you know, a knitting circle, uh, you know, something silly like that, but they will talk. They're creating little communities within your community of your organization, you know, and then out into your your city and your town. You've got various different communities there, Italian communities, you know, um, religious institutions and um, sports leagues and different things like that. So there are so many different communities and they're all interconnected because the four people that are curling could meet and find out that, hey, I didn't know such and such was happening uh, at, at work. And all of a sudden you realize I'm a part of that. Oh, and obviously my message isn't getting out. So when I started, I was instantly thinking that this is so much bigger than just a bread basket. You know, it's not just a nice little box that we look at and put everything in. It is huge. You know, how people act, talk, think, communicate, respond, you know, uh, before, during, and after. And all the different players that come in. And I just thought, wow, this is so much bigger. Yeah. And that's when I really started to find a passion for it. Excellent. Excellent. And, I, and I'm so glad you mentioned communities relative to organizations. I, I you know, I, I can't remember if I shared with you. Uh, or at least through my conversations as I've done recordings and what have you, I mentioned um, Brad Barton and Mark Ferraro. And those two gentlemen have been tremendous in my journey, very openly. Uh, Brad Barton focuses on value and product management and what have you. And Mark Ferraro focuses on communities, if you will, very explicitly, because that is a secret sauce, quite honestly, in organizations, exactly as, as, as you've mentioned. So I, I definitely appreciate the the, you mentioning that tremendously, tremendously. Yeah, and you, know, you walk down the hall, you're trying to get a message out about business continuity and you walk down the hallway and you run into someone that maybe you're in the same curling league with and you start chatting up and, and you, you can't help but ask, well, what are you working on now? What are you doing? You know, oh, I'm doing this. Oh, what's that about? And that's your opportunity there to get start getting your message out or theirs getting their message out. And it's done through a different community. Cur the Curling League is the link, not yeah. the actual uh, company you're working for. So that, that little community you can leverage and use to get your messages out there. And I think they, the people forget and try to say that when you're in these four walls, you're all going to be the same. You're all going to do what we expect you to do. And that's not necessarily right. <laughs> no, no. And it does, it's not realistic, quite honestly, yeah. because, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it, it, it tremendously negatively impacts the human element all around. So 100% with you. Agreed. So, so my good friend, in the description, you continue, you talk about, you talk about uh, in particular, not only plans and individuals and organizations and protecting themselves, but you, you get to the point where you say, uh, there is a myth that disasters happen to others, if you will. So the myth aspect is, is, is a great hook that grabs us mentally and on an emotional level. And then you continue to say, well, you know, it's about awareness, communications, and knowledge. And that, that next element, I'd love for your thoughts around that. Well, ever since I've started, we all run into uh, not just leadership, but even people we, we are working with that say that'll never happen to us because it's never happened to us. And a lot of times that's because of fear. You don't want to admit that you're vulnerable. And I don't mean vulnerable by having, you know, your doors wide open or you never secure your IT infrastructure. I just mean you're simply fearful that something's going to happen. So if I ignore it, I feel better. And that can be leaders can think that way. Employees can think that way. A, a lot of people can think that way. But really, I like to use the analogy sometimes there. You can have 100 people in a room and every single one of them is saying it'll never happen to me. It, it's only going to happen to you. Well, you may be saying that about the other 99 people. Guess what the other 99 people are thinking about you? The exact same thing. It's going to happen to you. And it does. And it doesn't have to be something big. It can be something small. Everything happens. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And no, no, no community, no individual, no organization, no department 
even within an organization, exist in a vacuum on their own. They're all interdependent. So something can happen somewhere and it's going to impact you one way or another. So the myth that it's you're never going to be hit with a disaster uh, is wrong because you in today's world, and we're seeing it now, something can happen on the other side of the world. Your business is fine right now, but because of supply chain uh, dependencies, suddenly you can't operate. And yet it was caused by something on the other side of the world. Well, so you can't say that nothing will ever happen. And as we sit here now, there are snowstorms happening in California, up to six, six to 12 feet in California. I'm in Canada, you're in Canada. When we think of California, we're thinking palm trees and the coast, you know, warm ocean breezes. We're not thinking that they're getting snowstorms. Well, imagine what they're thinking and what they're going through. You know, they're being impacted. If there are manufacturing plants there, Silicon Valley uh, has, has an issue chances are pretty good. We're going to feel that eventually at some point. So there's no way anyone can say that it's a myth that it'll never happen to us. It does. It happens. Things happen to us on a daily basis. And I mentioned the example of a car accident or something like that. Something always happens. We get sick, a family member, uh, anything like that. There, there's just no way anyone can say that it will never happen to them. They will never experience uh, a, a situation. The only thing that's permanent in the world is impermanence. You know, so because nothing stays still, you know, there's a, there's a line in a song um, by Marillion and uh, I love the line and it's one day every pebble hits the beach. It may take some time, but it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Alex, I don't know. I, I don't think I shared it with you, but the word myth is one of the hooks that I use to pull you into my conversations when I work with clients and pull your show into my my conversations because I always talk about people dealing with reality and uh, and I say, hey, you know, a lot of executives are, are quite honestly, people in the world are not dealing with reality. It's a facade that they're dealing with and they're not confronting reality. So they, they ask me, so, okay, so if we're not dealing with reality, what are we dealing with? And I said, well, you're dealing with myths and you want to pierce some of them, take a listen to Alex's show. Yeah, they, you know, th it's there's so many different pieces that uh, leadership are, are dealing with. Um, and sometimes the word assumptions get in there. I assume, uh, which could actually be replaced yeah. sometimes with myths. Um, I assume my leadership knows what to do. I assume my employee base or my crisis manager or my vice presidents, whatever, all know what to do. But they're all saying that about everybody. So yeah. that usually tells you nobody is doing anything. You know, and we, we've gone through, um, you know, such and such situation. We, we made it through the pandemic. So we're okay with every disaster. Really? So let me go set your building on fire. And let me see how you respond. And we'll see if yeah. you can uh, you know, act the same way if you've got it all in, in place or an active shooter. And you have, sadly, you know, and hopefully not, casualties. Are you really going to respond the same way? Are you going to feel the same way? Are you going to expect people who just watched or, or saw that terrible situation unfold, saw their friends and colleagues get injured or killed, and you think they're going to respond the same way um, that a uh, a loose plug on a server situation occurs? No. <laughs> you know, yeah. where's that human aspect? Where's that piece in there? And when it when people keep thinking that yeah, it'll happen to someone else, no, 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 no. There are so many different pieces here. The personal aspect. Where's that part? That's the the assumption and the the uh, the piece that a lot of organizations, leadership, and even people in, in my industry forget that that's not the way things unfold. I can honestly sit here right now, if I was in a situation like that, yeah, I would know what to do on some level, but I can tell you right now, if I saw something, there's gonna be a couple of hours of trauma that I'm going through first. And I am not gonna be thinking about calling up a vendor to start up our external uh, site or, you know, calling my leadership, I am literally going to be shaking, trying to process what I just saw. Yeah. And, and people forget that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the phraseology of reducing the suffering, if you will, I think is so central. Likewise, exactly as you're describing, it goes, it returns us back to the human element and the manifestation of that suffering that, that occurs in those situations. 
Yeah, that goes back to my uh, my Buddhist uh, practice uh, is, um, you know, instead of yeah, all these different tags and labels that you can throw out, it's I don't want people or organizations or community to suffer. Yeah. You know, and that could be anything. I don't want you to go through a bad PR experience. I don't want you, your, your facility to burn down. I don't want your people to uh, die because of COVID or you know, whatever the situation would be. It's you know, it's all suffering. It's whatever makes your organization and your people and the people you work with and their families, what upsets them. Yeah. You know, and it, it doesn't have to be something major and catastrophic like some people tend to think of. Let's just focus on the big catastrophes. What's the little things that that get you? You know, and so suffering to me is anything that will impact you, anything that could harm you. And I would like to be in a position where I can share that information with other people, regardless of what industry they're in, wherever they live in the world, reduce it if I can. You know, yeah. to make things better for you, you know, educate you and those around you. And even if it doesn't, a situation occurs and it doesn't impact you directly, you can turn around and be able to help someone else, you know, pass it, pass it along, so to speak. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So, so to summarize, I want to, I want to kind of just share a statement and then have you have your thoughts on it and refine it and modify it and, you know, kind of guide us a little bit, but summarize uh, kind of what the description that you've provided and when I communicate relative to your show, if you will, I say awareness, communication, and knowledge are the means for individuals, organizations, and communities to be well-prepared, protect themselves, minimize the suffering as a result of sudden unplanned natural and human-made events. And I try to provide that summary, but I would love your thoughts on that. And I know I, I haven't shared that with you before, but you know, any thoughts or any, any uh, modifications, please don't hesitate to guide me. Uh, well, you'll notice that I didn't mention the word plans in there. And that was intentional because I didn't want people to think that if they had a plan, a binder, a, a big thick binder that nobody's going to read, you know, that that's their, their fail safe. We've got this big binder, so we're done. No, no, no. Teach everyone, let them grow, let them contribute, get their ideas, then start putting things together and getting everyone talking together, which is the communication and realizing that communication isn't just me as the resilience or business continuity or disaster recovery or whoever person shouting off all these instructions, telling you this is what you need, this is what you should do. But blah, blah, blah. that's not communication. That's not dialogue. That's monologue. Communication is dia is also dialogue. So me listening, you know, I've got two ears. So I should be listening to their ideas. Well, you know, we wouldn't do that, actually. We would do this. Well, that's fantastic. Great. I just learned something. Let's capture that. So, and if you can get your organization leadership and their teams uh, talking, then you're going to start creating the operational resilience. Then you're going to start getting everyone's awareness and understanding um, and their, their skill levels up. And when something does occur, it may not be as impactful as it could have been simply because everyone has been communicating. Everyone knows who to communicate to, when to communicate, what to communicate. They have the awareness of what's required, where they're, even if they do have to refer to a plan or uh, an SOP or some, some other document, they know where it is. They know how to access it. They know exactly what page to turn to. And they share all this knowledge, you know, hey, such and such didn't work. They share the negative stuff too, not just the positive stuff so that you continually increase. And I think that's why uh, I didn't say plan. Mm -hmm. that's why I think that's why I know that's why I didn't say plan. It's because the secret ingredient to all of it is the people and how they're going to work together and teach each other new things. And uh, so that's my comment on that part. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So, so my good friend, you know, any any sort of more to share relative to kind of what energized you to embark on the journey and, you know, kind of the origins, the motivations, the intentions, you know, relative to the show particularly? Uh, that was completely by accident. <laughs> I, I had no interest and no desire. I didn't even have the thought of doing a podcast or anything along that lines. I received an email from Dee Daniels, my executive producer at Voice America, and the first time I read it, I went, oh, that's got to be spam. But I didn't hit the delete button. Hmm. Strangely enough, I, I I guess something must have uh, been in the back of my head. Don't don't hit delete. And I left it for a couple of days. And then I went back to it. 
And I went, this just, something doesn't seem right about this email, that it wasn't spam. And I started reading it again and there were a few comments. So I started to do an internet search. Okay, who is this person? Okay, and it all started to line up. I went, oh, this is actually valid. And they, what they were doing is they were looking for a couple of new hosts for shows on their network. And they came across me. I, I still don't know who did or how they found me, but they reached out and said, you know, your crisis management, your disaster and business continuity would make a really interesting topic for the show. Would you be interested in, you know, maybe starting something up? You know, do you, do you want to do that? And I thought, well, okay, well, we'll try it out for 13 uh, weeks, which is a, a season. And I loved it. But the very first episode, you can tell I was a little nervous and you know, over, just terrible. I cringe every time I hear it, but <laughs> but it's fun to hear <laughs> for me anyway. And it just kept going. And I, as I was finding people, then I started to get listeners reaching in. Hey, I'd like to be a guest on the show. Uh, okay. So what started out as a single 13 uh, episode season I'm now into, uh, what is it, 26, 20? No, it's 28. I'm into my uh, last uh, season for 28. Yeah, I'm starting to record that. So, and it just kept going because, and like we said at the beginning, I felt I was learning. I'm going, I'm learning so much more. This is great. And I got to get, help people get their messages out, like yourself. You know, get your message, share what you have to uh, share with the world and and, you know, hopefully all together we can make changes by sharing our knowledge and skills and experiences. Um, some of those are have been the, wow, um, the most heartfelt episodes ever when people are sharing their own personal stories. I had, uh, I couldn't help but laugh um, with one guest, uh, David uh, Gill, who was on a little while ago, telling me, you know, he was all bubbly and, but he was telling me about being shot at and, you know, having, being in the Amazon with, with the, I can't remember the name of some big fancy name disease, but uh, you know, worm, worms and things in his arm, and you know, just, and I kind of, oh my god, all these things you've gone through, and he's bubbly, and you're like, yeah, they're all learning experiences, you know, and it's like, wow, you know, I can't believe someone sharing that much personal detail, uh, and sitting here, you know, like, wow, you know, that's the essence, the epitome of resilience, you know, not letting yourself get knocked down. But getting right back up and keep going and then i had a, another personal episode um and travers who grew up in the troubles in northern ireland and uh, lost a family member um, and she talked about the whole thing and i barely said a word to the whole thing uh, because i was english and i remember as a kid uh, still living in england that uh, there were some incidents you know related to the troubles um, that happened in england so I was well aware of it and sitting there listening to her story, I was just, wow. Like, yeah. you know, if I could reach through the screen and give her a hug, I would have, you know, it was just incredible. And I think those experiences, you don't get too many of those in life where somebody really opens up. And uh, I'm so grateful that I can continue doing that. And even on a professional level, when people come in and say, yeah, we tried X, Y, Z, it didn't work. Uh, you know, it was a failure. And they're coming right out and they're sharing that, hey, I was a failure. I did terrible at that. Uh, but this is what I learned. You know, I was like, wow. You know, that that's show strength and character of the person. And I really, really enjoy that. And that's what keeps me going of doing these shows over and over again is learning from all these different people. And, uh, you know, have learning a lot along the way, but having a lot of laughs too. I don't want everyone to think that we're not laughing and, you know, having a joke because like I said earlier, you know, I have no problem making myself look stupid. So... I'll ask questions that just, you know, make someone laugh or, you know, share my own stupidity, you know, when I've done stupid things in the past and continue to do. <laughs> we're human. Exactly. To your point, we're human. And I hope, you know, I, forgive me if I interrupted you, Alex. I don't know if you had more at all. Go ahead. One of the things that I always actually point people to is I point them back to your first episode, to be honest with you. And I tell them, listen to the first episode, listen to the current episode and, and listen to how Alex took a risk in doing the first episode. 
because it's a tremendous learning opportunity. And respectfully, there's a lot of people that want to do something, but they don't take the first step. They don't take that that reasonably measured risk that they can can you know move forward with. So, and I've gotten a lot of feedback. They say I love listening to the first one and listening to the current ones because it gives me a perspective on Alex's journey. Yeah, I, I get a, like I said, I get a chuckle listening to that first one, and sometimes I cringe, like oh my goodness. But at the same time, I'm glad I did it. Yeah, you know, I have absolutely no regrets in doing it, and I, I always encourage people. You know, I don't know if I should do this or should do that. What's your heart tell you? I really want to do it. Well, then do it. What if I fail? Well, then it's not in your heart. You're letting your head take over. You know, take the risk. The worst thing that'll ever happen is you won't succeed, but you will learn for it, from it and you will move forward. You won't be going backwards. You know, so don't, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, if I take a risk and I fail, I'm going to be going backwards. No, you're not. You're just where you were. That's all. You know, you, you may have fallen down. Just get up and go forward. And I, I, you know, I, I feel for people who are that afraid to take risks. You know, and let's be realistic; it depends on what it is they want to try and do. Yeah. You know, um, but a lot of people are too afraid of what the ramifications would be. You know, if I fail, well, why aren't you thinking about what's going to happen when you succeed? Yeah. And if you think that way, all those things that you're thinking negatively about, you're going to start doing your risk mitigation, you're going to start putting plans in place or uh, eliminating the risk altogether or bringing in someone to help you or whatever the case may be. But some people, unfortunately, focus so much on that negative aspect, then they're afraid to take a risk and move forward. And then later on in life, oh, you start hearing, I wish I had done, I wish I had done. And it's like, no, so far I can say that yeah, I tried things. I fell flat on my face. I, my first book, I... <laughs> I, I laugh at it now, but you know, first first time author, great. I'll everyone's going to want me, you know. And I sent letters out to all the chambers of commerce across Canada that I would speak, and uh, had a new book, and you know, I, all this kind of stuff. And um, there was a couple of hundred of those uh, that all went out these little packages, and I didn't get a single response. <laughs> that was humbling. <laughs> but I thought, okay, that's not the way to do that again. <laughs> I can laugh now, but boy, yeah. I felt bad back then. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm not afraid to try new things. You know, we've done live broadcasts now, and we just keep going, and uh, it builds your confidence. And you know, what road doesn't have potholes? Yeah. You're going to encounter them. So, you know, just accept it, and move on. You know, we keep telling each other in our industry to be adaptable and be able to pivot and you know, be agile. Yeah. And then when we encounter something. We're none of those things, yeah. you know, or we're too afraid to encounter those things. So it, it, it's sometimes I think a lot of people preach one thing, but actually do something else. But I'm all for preach it and do it. Beautifully said, beautifully said, uh, uh, beautifully. So, so as I mentioned, when we first started, you know, uh, this conversation, if you will, numerous guests, numerous topics, breadth and depth that you've covered again, since 2017, you know, I, I want I want to take you know just a few topics that you think are, are key for our audience. You know, topics, subjects, themes, whatever you'd like to call them, that are really crucial for for our audience to to hear from you and just kind of elaborate them, and we can engage a little bit on them, whatever you like. But I'd love you know for you to to share with us. Well, that was a hard one to nail down because regardless, depending on where you are in the world and what industry you're in, and uh, if you're experiencing something or not a key topic in our world changes daily. You know, what's happening in California now uh, is different. You know, a few months ago, they were talking about floods uh, and drought. Now they're talking about snowstorms. So it, for them, it's climate, climate change. Yeah. I think that one has seems to have really uh, gotten more focus over the years um, because that's happening everywhere. In here in Guelph, Ontario, where I live, we have no snow. We had one big snowstorm and one and a half, I'd say, snow squalls, quote unquote, storms. You know, nothing major. But we've had lots of rain. We had gray skies. Uh, you know, we've got no snow right now, and it's March 1st. You know, yeah, we are being <laughs> impacted by some sort of a change that's going on. And then you've got the east coast of Canada who are burying out of, you know, meters of snow. You know, homes being... Uh, 
literally covered, you know, and it's just so strange. You know, the, the weather in the UK, um, they're not getting the uh, the rain that they usually get, considering uh, was the last year or the year before, the source of the Thames went dry. Mm-hmm. You can imagine if the Thames went dry, you know, in, in England, oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, but it's happening everywhere. The tundra is is, is uh, melting, which is impacting the wildlife, which is impacting those that live up there. You know, it's re- releasing uh, different um, compounds that we haven't been uh, open to yet. So we don't know if some of this stuff is going to harm us because we've never been around some of this stuff. And it, those kind of situations are happening all around the world. You know, and, and I think that's, you know, climate change, the winds that we're picking up in uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, some of the biggest storms they have, well, that caused caused that ship to uh, block the Suez Canal. Yeah. You know, and then look what happened after that, all the supply chains. So I think climate change is something that everyone is looking at, regardless of what industry they're in now. And uh, hopefully, well, it has to be governments, you know, that we can do our own parts, but government's got to uh, recognize this. And that's one of the big things that uh, is happening everywhere that we're focusing on. Um, the next one, uh, see, I had a list here and it it kept changing. So I kind of had to group things around and I ended up with, the next one is resilience in its all its forms. Mm. The personal organization, operational community, you know, and th- there are so many different tags people put on it, but simply being have having the ability to fall down and get back up and learn from it and keep going. That's what everyone has to learn how to do. Uh, I think I, there may have been a time in history where we could rely on our neighbors and rely on uh, different groups to be able to help us, but there's so many people in the world and there's so many different aspects and so many things going on that I don't think we can re- rely on that anymore. You know, we've, we've got to be able to educate ourselves and uh, you know, how we interact with each other and we can help each other that way. It's like being on an airplane. You know, when they tell you the, the mass drop down, take care of yourself first mm-hmm. and you can help everyone. Then you're better positioned to help everyone else. It doesn't mean you ignore everyone else. It's just you're now better positioned. And I think sometimes organizations and resilience professionals forget that, hey, we have to look at this on a personal level. And when all the people are thinking right and communicating and interrelating, then we can get better operational resilience. And then when that's happening, we're building a culture. Now we're getting into the organizational resilience where we've got a culture where everyone is doing that. We're all in, inter, intermingling and helping each other out. And I think that you know, we try too much to go to, let's get operational right off the bat. Meanwhile, everyone that's talking in the room hasn't a clue what resilience is. They've all got a defin- different definition, you know, or they simply just, whatever, I'll do, I'll take care of it when it happens, you know. Yeah. So it's, that that's the second one, I think, that uh, is on everyone's mind. And let's face it, there's a lot of standards and guidance that is, are coming out right now from um, England a couple of years ago, the Bank of England, um, EU, um, there's stuff that's happening now here in Canada with uh, OSFI for financial institutions. Um, they're going to be putting out something uh, final in the fall, I think, for uh, operational resilience. So all these things come out, and you know, that's so it's a big topic whether people want to uh, uh, realize it or not. And you can call it business continuity. You can call it disaster planning because it all incorporates the same same things. You know. Um, resilience is resilience well that's the same as business continuity is resilience it's emergency management it's all these different pieces and they they all have to work together and that's so i think it's people now for that one are waking up going okay we have to take this seriously you know i think people forgot after y2k you know nothing happened at y2k because so it kind of went out the window you know and everyone forgot about it but now all that stuff is coming back because let's look at the world what's going on in the world which is the third one uh is, and it's the uh the title that's used now polycrisis mm-hmm. multiple things going around on around the world and I, I gave the example earlier on that something can happen somewhere else it doesn't on the surface it doesn't look like it's going to impact you but because you're doing business with someone else who is impacted by that you become impacted by it 
you know, and that's happening with uh, climate events, that's happening with political events, it's happening, unfortunately, with war in more than one location, uh, it's happening with uh, governments uh, that are changing, because this year in 2024, I think, I think it was uh, 60 or 65 percent, something like that, of governments around the world, it's an election year. So there's change, you know, changes are coming, you know, as uh, I think that's what Bob Dylan used to yeah. sing that, yeah. you know, <laughs> changes are coming, so, or something like that. So all these different things that uh, are happening around the world, we have to pay attention to. We've got to look at it and we've got to learn from what's happening over there. Am I doing business with anybody over there? Uh, I'm not, but I got to watch to see if something does impact me. And maybe I could learn something if there's a, uh, a financial institution in XYZ country that has an issue. And I work for a financial institution company. Whether you're impacted or not, take a look. If that mm -hmm. happens to me, can I learn from it? Can I learn from that and then make a change here? You know, and, and I think that's something else that people forget is lessons learned means change. If nothing changes, nothing is learned. You know, it's just observed. And I, I think that a lot of people forget about. But the poly crisis, it happens. It, it, it's a relatively new term, though it has been, it was introduced a, a few years ago by, uh, I used to have the name written in front of me, but um, I learned it from Regina Phelps, uh, where it actually originated. And it's now become something that everyone's looking at. And I, I mentioned it's looking at the government, it's looking at the wars, it's looking at policies, the standards and guidelines, the climate change, all these multiple events that are happening around the world. We And I, you know, social media has actually helped us with that because now with social media, we can find out something is happening around the world a lot quicker than waiting for the 11 p.m. nightly news you know, and find out that, oh, today or yesterday, something happened. Now it's two minutes ago, <laughs> such and such happened. And you know, right off the bat, we have to take a look. Am I, am I impacted? Is this going, going to impact me? Do I know anybody there? Do I have employees there? Do I have friends, family? You know, and all these different things keep coming into play. So, it, and nothing, uh, how should I say that? The, the, the world right now is in constant, constant turbo flux. You know, it, it's, there's nothing that stands still right now anywhere in the world. And one thing that is happening like the war in Ukraine is impacting famine in Africa. But yet we only really see what's happening uh, on the news on the battlefield. But there's another battle going on in other places of the world as a result of that. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's something that I think is a key topic right now with polycrisis. So climate change, resilience in all its forms, and polycrisis are the big three right now. Tomorrow, something else will happen, and we'll change that list. But today, that's what I, I nailed down. Excellent. Excellent. I want to dive in a little bit deeper, if you will, and kind of get your thoughts uh, around some of uh, the, the, the topics that you've identified. The question that immediately comes to my mind when I hear climate change, you know, our organizations, our governments, our people taking it now seriously enough, and the key word being enough. I don't know if all are, I can't say that all are, but I think many more are. There's a lot more people paying attention to it because of the storms that do occur. And the, you know, I mentioned earlier on, we don't have a lot of snow where I am. We're already talking, myself and neighbors, so, uh, and we work for companies, we're concerned about what the summer's going to bring with forest fires, because they're going to be a lot drier. Well, that's happening out in the West, Western Canada, that's happened in Western US. It's happened even on the East Coast now, um, where there was fire outside of the city of Halifax uh, last year. So I think a lot of people are now waking up to the fact that climate change is something that they really need to impact because one thing that the pandemic did is allowed organizations to have people work remotely from all across the country now. They can, a Vancouver company can hire somebody in Miami but if Miami has a uh, hurricane come through, well, then they've lost the, the employee, potentially lost the employee for a while, while that employee gets to safety. So less productivity. So I think organizations are realizing that, hmm, 
we have to do something about this. We, we've got people that are working in these uh, disaster prone areas or weather related areas. Uh, what happens if they aren't available? What do we do? How do we keep our operations going? How do we keep that person safe? What do we need to provide them? So I think they, a lot more than what used to, are waking up. There are still, and we see them unfortunately all the time, no such thing as climate change. You know, yeah. There's nothing happening. But yet storms are getting bigger, they're lasting longer, they're occurring more often, uh, forest fires, uh, winter storms, uh, you know, different parts of the world, hurricanes, typhoons, whatever case uh, the situation may be, it's, it is occurring. And I think a lot of people are now starting to realize that, yes, there's still a ways to go. I think there's still a lot of deniers out there, but I think with recent events over the last few years, that now organizations and leadership are starting to say, hey, this is now a concern we need to think about. Excellent, excellent. And this, and of course, all these topics are very, very wide reaching. So I, I definitely wanna, wanna at least get a few questions on, on each of them, if you will, to get your thoughts. I, I love the way that you described resilience, falling down, getting back up and keep going. I and mean, that, that's a great way to, to, to describe it, if you will, with all the under su subtopics and sub subjects. One of the questions that I'd love your thoughts on is, are, are we leveraging the standards appropriately? Are there too many standards? Are there not enough standards? Kind of how the standards are influencing the practitioners, et cetera, and how practitioners are using the standards. Uh, standards, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think all the st sometimes there seems to be too many uh, standards um, and there becomes too many when some industries are seeing it more as a financial opportunity create a standard sell it you know, and we can make some money from the other side of the fence i think i don't support 100 percent every standard mm -hmm. but i don't uh see anything where i should put any standard down i think every single one has something to offer because they're all usually coming from a different perspective or a different industry or an experience of the, the writers that are putting it together. So I think there's good in all the standards. And if you're in a small business or a large organization, you can use those to help guide what works best for you. I'm, I'm not one who likes to just follow one, one process and that's the only way to do it. No, there are, you know, that's why the words like demonstrate how to do such and such, which means you can come up with your own way of doing that. As long as you can show X, Y, Z, you know, and you get that result, how you do it is up to the organization. And I think a lot of people misinterpret that as I have to do it this one way. So there's a lot of things in these uh, standards and guidelines that I think if organizations really take the time, and, and I know it's not easy, pick what works best for you and then adopt it. You know, if... I know that's a challenge for some organizations because you're in a financial institution, you have to follow specific guidelines and you must do things a certain way. So be it. But 95% of businesses are small businesses. So they're not going to be doing it that way. Yeah. They've got to find something more effective, more uh, fit for purpose for them. And I think if you can, if you have all these standards and guidelines out there, pick what works best for you. It doesn't have to be everything but they all offer value. And I, I think they can uh, help you in what it is you need to do. And you know, like I said, use, use them wisely. They are there to help after all. Yeah, words of wisdom, words of wisdom all around, because exactly to your point, every standard comes in with a different perspective, but the, the onus is on the practitioners, people like yourselves, like myself, if you will, in order to, to leverage those standards in context, applying critical thinking and deliberate practice versus blindly following or not following. Yeah. So I really, you know, words of wisdom that you, you've shared with us, and I really hope people kind of embrace it because otherwise with everything that's happening, we're really gonna suffer even more than we've ever suffered. Yes, and I, I have seen some organizations who do try to just, we're going to follow this this uh, standard or guideline. Well, then they, they end up butting heads with their own teams because that's not the way we do things. You're actually making us change the way we do things now. And the, the way you're making us change is not efficient. You know, it's causing issues now. 
So right there, well, then why are you, you, you shouldn't be adopting your organization to the standard. Take the standard and adopt what works for you to your organization. Yeah, yeah. words of wisdom, definitively words of wisdom. And then I want to ask a question around polycrisis because because it's interesting. And here's uh, definitely very interested in your perspective on this. When I mention the word polycrisis to a lot of clients, uh, existing, new, you know, even people I've had long term relationships with, very long term relationships, the, their immediate response is, well, it's another marketing term. And, I, and then so I avoid using the word sometimes, quite often, actually emphasize that crises are entangled because we live in reality, crises are entangled. So I would love your thoughts on the following sort of question is, have we hurt ourselves by so much terminology? Have we hurt ourselves by the things that we've done by not aligning on terminology sometimes now that we have poly crises, et cetera, and we want to raise awareness? So any any you know thoughts there? Yes, very much so. I, uh, I've been a champion you know and I'm any chance I get where I can complain about this I do and that's the the terminology I know we've got different uh, industry groups out there and you know they all offer wonderful things the only thing I wish they would do is agree on the terminology because when I say disaster planning in a client site that could mean one thing to them but I'm saying something else emergency management or business continuity or you know, all these different terms, they have different definitions and people go, and you know, I do too, look it up online, find out, okay, what's meant by that. So this is the term that they use. And meanwhile, an industry guideline is saying it's something else. And then the practitioner or consultant comes along and uses a different term, uh, diff uses it in a different way. So we shoot ourselves in the foot because we don't have the standard terminology that we're using. We all like our own little, um, I guess, and it could be for marketing, could you use that word, you know, to, to promote our own uh, terminology, glossaries and things like that. You know, we want people to come to our site, so we'll change our definitions and have our own setup, uh, so to speak. And I just, that drives me crazy. I presented a conference in Toronto, uh, I guess it would be 2017, 2018, and I was on a panel discussion at the end, and there was the question, you know, what drives you, uh, I forgot the exact question, but someone on the lines of what drives you crazy, you know, in our industry. And somebody that was sitting beside me, this young lady, she was new to the industry. She slammed her head down on the desk and said, terminology, why can't we get a single list of terminology? And I thought, well, we're trying to get new people in the industry. We're trying to promote our industry. Here's someone new. And the first thing out of her mouth is she, she's, fed up with the terminology already. So yeah, we shoot ourselves in the foot by bringing out these new names. You know, we, we business continuity uh, was there on its own, plus resilience. Then it became business continuity and resilience. Now it's business resilience. Why can't we stick to it one term? Why do we have to keep changing it? Uh, I, I can't imagine uh, plumbers or electricians changing their terminology all the time. They have a set definition of what things are. Why can't we? You know, we, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. And it's why some people can't uh, or sometimes don't take us seriously is because if you can't define who you are and you can't speak the same language, then why should I pay attention? And that, that shoots us in the foot, uh, you know, like you said. And I, it drives me crazy that terminology is something that we should, as an industry, regardless of country regardless of what it you know whatever we should have one definition for what business continuity is or resilience um, but i know it's difficult and i so i mentioned uh, a while ago that uh, use the definition that works best in your organization then and if you bring in an outside source a consultant a contractor tell them what your definition is and they should change uh, to you so that that way, everyone in your organization is working with the same definition. You know what it means from the so, someone in the C-suite to the newest person walking in the door knows exactly what business continuity means. Not everyone having their own interpretation of it. Very well said. Very well said. And, and quite honestly, I mean, I, I think you're emphasizing some 
you're emphasizing something very key as to why I love what you're doing and with the show and everything that you're contributing. It helps us as an industry mature relative yeah. to knowledge. I mean, just it really helps us mature by sharing and learning, fostering community and what have you. So definitively. Yeah. It's why I, I often ask uh, guests if we're talking about resilience or operational resilience or whatever the case, I always ask, how do you define it? Yeah. Just so that that way we're on the same playing field. And then anyone who's listening to the episode will know that this is the perspective they're coming from. Now I understand. But if we just start talking, then you, I just know a listener out there is going to say, well, that's not my definition of resilience. So what you're saying doesn't make sense. Well, it does if you understood the definition that was being used. Exactly. Exactly. Well, my good friend, I know we can dive very deep across all these topics, but I definitely want to, you know, so hopefully you'll come back and join us in the future uh, sure. all, all around, Alex. And uh, I, any sort of final comments, my good friend? Oh, boy. Again, I could go on forever. Um, but I guess anyone who's listening and uh, in our in our field, just realize you can't do it alone um, and listen more than you talk. You know, the your answers to all the problems that you're trying to solve, they're in your organization. You just haven't heard them yet. Yeah. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. With that, Alex, a pleasure having you. The invitation always stands for you to return, my good friend, anytime. And by all means, we look forward and thank you for everyone that's joining us. So thank you again, Alex, for making the time. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.